Are we live? We are indeed. People are starting joining. Uh, let's give it a little bit of time. Awesome. 28, 31, 38. Hello, everyone. Hello, hello. Yeah, we'll give it a couple of minutes and then we'll kind of, I guess, jump into it and make some intros and um, kind of hand over, hand over, to, uh, hand over to Johnny uh, to kind of introduce Klarna. Mm, we've already got people putting their hands up. Very keen. Yeah, we do. See, our faces have raised a lot of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, so let's just uh, got 82 people in the room at the moment and growing. So thank you for coming, everyone. How are we all? How's how's Jason? How's Johnny? Just we'll do some we'll do some general chit chat. We'll pretend like we haven't been talking to each other for five or ten minutes before this. Well, the word everyone uses is coping. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, no, I'm enjoying it actually, weirdly enough. Uh, Mark says, doing very, very well. Uh, my first time meeting you all. My shop is only eight weeks old. Uh, hi, Michelle. Welcome. Aaron, hello. Lots and lots of people here. It's good, nearly 100 now. Awesome. Uh, I'm going to lower everyone's hands just for a little bit, and we'll get to that shortly. <laughs> Uh, I don't think you need to explain the process of how to raise your hand. It seems like no. I think everyone's everyone is. Um, lots of people, uh, lots of people, already chatting, um, which is great. So we'll go through the kind of functions and features at the minute. Um, I said we'll give it to five past Jason and then get going with the intros. Uh, all the lots of people joining. Uh, welcome everyone if you just joined. I'm going to get started properly in the next three or four minutes. Um, but thank you everyone for joining so far. Thank you for your time, Mark. Appreciate it. Um, people here three weeks into their online store, eight weeks into their online store. Lots of new people. Lots of people joining Shopify. That's good to see. Oh, up to 116, 117. I'm all the new people. We just we need to keep sharing everyone. If you if you get people to sign up, get them to join in. We should have more and more people. Um, Twelve week old store here. Someone been using Shopify for two years. It's a nice mix. It's good. Welcome to my living room, Jason's living room, Johnny's kitchen. My spice rack often gets a lot of attention. Um, yes, absolutely. Feel free to direct any questions about that to uh, the Q&A at the bottom. Absolutely. <laughs> any questions about Johnny's rack, just <laughs> right down there in the Q&A. More than happy to answer those. As best I can. <laughs> um, moving my site from Shopify from Magento as we speak, Gabriella, that's what we like to hear. Always a good idea. It's always, always a good, good idea. idea. You're our favourite kind of person. Um, loving the spice rack from Rob Taylor. Thanks, Rob. I'm sure Johnny appreciates <laughs> that. Johnny's rack is not all it's cracked up to be. Well, Amanda. Uh, that's many a time, many a time. Okay, okay. <laughs> uh, been using Shopify for three months. Uh, right. I think we're about five minutes in. 134 people now. 135. Um, uh, some people moving. We're going to get into the kind of in-depth chat and Q and A and stuff shortly. Um, right now, I think I'll hand over to Jason. Jason is going to do a bit of an intro. Um, then I'll I'll lead you through how this is going to work today. It's a bit unusual for us, so please bear with us if there's any issues. Uh, hopefully there won't be. And then uh, we'll also be chatting to Johnny, and then there'll be plenty of time for questions, uh, etc. Afterwards. So. Jason, over Thanks, to you. Thanks, Lewis. Um, yeah, so this is the first, uh, I guess, virtual Shopify meetup we put on um, at Isoco. We usually put one on uh, once a quarter in Birmingham. 
Um, so yeah, thank you to everybody for kind of signing up and attending. Um, it's great to have you all here. Um, my name is Jason Stokes. I'm the founder of a company or a Shopify Plus agency called Eastside Co. Um, as far as kind of our agency goes, we hen, uh, we help clients kind of um, from cradle to grave really when it comes to e-commerce. Um, we work with lots of different kind of sized clients, lots of different verticals, um, from challenger brands that are disrupting kind of marketplaces all the way through to kind of tier one clients. Um, so we've got a, a very kind of deep and broad uh, kind of level of experience. Um, so hopefully we'll be able to answer kind of a number of questions and touch on a number of the topics of questions that have come through um, over the uh, kind of over the, the sign-up process. Um, so I know Johnny's got a bit of a, an intro to Klarna to go through uh, and Lewis is kind of comparing as well. So he'll be kind of um, taking questions and uh, uh, we'll kind of go through in a second how uh, how all this needs to be administered and uh, and kind of, yeah, how it's all going to work. Superb, having to remember to unmute myself, not a problem I usually have. Um, we're going to do all of the standard uh, unprecedented times, uh, what a weird world we're living in, uh, how is everyone coping, we'll do all of that, that's standard, we've got all those cliches down. So looking forward to getting through all those kind of questions. We will do a segment on uh, what the world is like during COVID for e-commerce, uh, for retail in general. And then we'll try to move on to some general kind of e-commerce questions as well as we go through. Just a little bit of housekeeping. So you all seem to have discovered the general chat, which is great. So within the chat, you can message either just us, the panelists, or uh, the panelists and the whole group. And you can have general chit chat in there, talk about Johnny's spice rack, uh, Jason's banister, whatever it is that's going on in your mind at that time, whatever you can see in the background. Um, I have a cat somewhere, maybe that will make an appearance. Um, so that's for general chat. You also have a Q&A section. So if you have a specific question that you want answering, um, then please put it in the Q&A. Within that, we'll be able to mark whether we're answering the question live. If it's a simple question, we'll be able to type a reply um, and it will be really clear what we're answering and what we're not. And it won't get missed like it might do in the chat. We also have a whole bunch of questions that have been submitted prior to uh, the webinar starting. So we're gonna try and get through as many of those as possible. In some cases, we may not be able to answer the question directly, but hopefully throughout the talk, we'll, we'll be able to answer broadly uh, some of the themes around the questions that you guys have been asking. Um, but we're really, really pleased to have so many of you on board. It's a really good opportunity for us to uh, break out of uh, the usual kind of geographical location of Birmingham, where we usually have our meetup and have so many people from different areas of the country and, and the world, hopefully. And we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can. Uh, if you want to speak, if we get the opportunity to do that, you can raise your hand. Uh, no promises as to whether we can uh, get to that point because there are so many questions being submitted already. Uh, but we'll try and monitor that as much as possible throughout the process. But for now, uh, you've all seen his rack, but it's time to, time to go into a bit more depth uh, with Johnny. He's going to do a small presentation. Um, what's your presentation on a gun, Johnny? I, I know this, um, obviously, because I've, I've done my preparation. So it's just a bit of an overview of, of how we see the modern day consumer uh, at Klarna, both online and in-store what motivates them, what demotivates them, why they spend, why they don't spend, and you know, why they keep on spending. So hopefully some really practical advice in there. Um, you know, even if you're three, four weeks old or you know, a number of years old, um, some, some really fascinating insights. Uh, Great. So yeah, I'm, I'm happy to, to fire it up if you're ready. Yeah, so we'll pass over to you, Johnny. Uh, so Johnny's gonna do his presentation now, then we'll move into the Q&A. Feel free to chat, ask any questions throughout the presentation. Um, and we'll get to those afterwards. But for now, over to you, Johnny. Yeah, so bear with me a second, just whilst I full screen this. So, hopefully, you should all be able to see my wonderful presentation with a beautiful Klarna pink and uh, one of our infamous gifts that, um, yeah, somewhat trademarked to, uh, to Klarna presentations. Um, so, yeah, I'm Johnny, ruined the surprise of that one. Cheers, Louis. Um, <laughs> I'm commercial manager at Klarna. Uh, been with Klarna uh, only about six months before I was at Draper's, uh, which is a big fashion uh, publication and events business, working on uh, the e-commerce uh, partnership side of things. 
So I was really um, had a bit of a sort of a dual view of the industry, both on the tech side and also from the retailer insight side. Um, so yeah, I've been uh, doing this sort of thing for, for a number of years. But uh, as I mentioned uh, in the presentation today, I'll give you a quick overview of where we see the modern day consumer, what motivates them to spend, keep on spending, and we'll give you those practical insights. Should take about 15 minutes. I timed it uh, earlier today and it was 15 minutes and four seconds. So uh, we'll try and keep it to, uh, to about that. Again, any questions um, at the bottom, but also my email address is there for anything that's very calm and specific. Uh, I don't want to go into a sort of full on sales pitch uh, on, on a presentation like this. But a quick overview of who we are. So we're very understated uh, with our branding. So uh, Klarna, uh, founded in Stockholm in 2005. We offer pay later checkout solutions to over 17 markets. I appreciate there's probably a bit of a delay, but to 200,000 merchants and over 85 million consumers. And it's those last two figures really that we feel give us that great insight uh, into understanding what the spending habits are and how we can analyze those figures. You know, we have great relationships with our merchants and they often say, oh, we noticed they were doing this versus this. Um, you know, obviously we won't give away any sort of internal information, but we can group it together and we can really um, start to draw some trends. Um, we also spend a lot of time on, on market research as well, um, aside from just looking at um, spending habits uh, of consumers. This is where we want to be. Uh, this is where we feel like we're on the journey to being a payment brand for the new fun financial generation. So what does that mean? Uh, it's not just aid when we talk about the new generation. It's all about looking at um, all about looking at habits, really, and what those common themes are across all age groups. Of course, there are new demographics, like Gen Z and millennials, not necessarily new, but um, in terms of the way we fill out the terms. Um, but we're actually going to focus on the characteristics of the modern day consumer. So I'll talk you through the pillars of what motivate them. Um, and if you can address these points as a new retailer, as an established retailer, you stand a fantastic chance of acquiring new consumers. So first of all, they're better informed. Reviews, as we know, are so easy to access, you know, coming away from like traditional retail, but like TripAdvisor, we TripAdvisor everything, don't we, before we, we check it out. Um, it's no different, no matter the industry. So um, be aware of that. Recommendations uh, under this point as well, from friends, from family. So 60% of consumers said that when they love a brand or a retailer, they'll tell their friends about it. Don't underestimate that. It's a great, great thing. Can also have some concerns, but you know, let's focus on the positive of it. Um, and this telling a, a friend or a family member about it, you know, traditionally it's word of mouth, but I think more increasingly so, it's now online. You know, you see a friend um, or post Instagram, um, you know, with their new trainers, and you say, you know, I want them. They don't even have to tell you about it anymore. So motivate your customers to generate their own content and make it easy for them to do as well. Like do it at the click of a button sort of stuff. Um, and also like be mobile first when it comes to that. And I will come on to mobile first a little bit more later on. But um, yeah, definitely focus on that user generated content. Um, that volatile. Now it's an interesting one, but 55% uh, of consumers say that a bad experience stops them from returning to a store or a website meaning all of that money you've wasted on acquiring that customer, it's pretty much wasted. So, you know, it's all about getting that, that engagement right. But that said, look, 45% would still go back to the store if, um, you know, if they've had a bad experience. So it means you've got a bit of a window really to get it right. So don't be scared of this disgruntled customer, whether again, online or in store, just know how to handle it. And I, I'm a firm believer, um, you know, I don't necessarily have the stats to back this one up, but I'm a huge believer in, when I've been an unhappy customer, if the, consumer, if the merchant has handled it correctly, you know, they've won me as a customer for life. Um, so I, I just think, bear that in mind. Sometimes, you know, when we're um, running stores online, that gets lost a little bit, but um, try and create that personal touch um, with, with the unhappy customers. They're more conscious. Now, this was even the case pre-COVID. So ethics, brand values were so, so important. Uh, sustainability was a massive factor in um, in deciding one brand over another. All of the data proves that post-COVID, 
you know, this will continue. Shoppers are shopping with more provenance uh, at the minute. You know, shopping locally, um, shopping in the community. What does this brand give back? Not necessarily to me, but what do they give back, you know, to the local area, to their suppliers, um, to the people that manufacture their materials? So just bear that in mind. And also, you know, think of the way you communicate that with the customers. You know, don't necessarily make it too wordy, but make it really, really simple. Um, and, you know, you can just have like, thinking of like a, a beauty example, um, there's quite a well-known um, makeup retailer online. They publish a blacklist of all of the processes, all of the products they do and don't use. Something like that could be really, really useful. You know, it's not in your face, but it's there if the, if the reader, reader, the consumer wants to access it. They're always on. Uh, so mobile generation, always connected, shopping around the clock 24 seven. If you're a millennial, um, you know, correct me if I'm wrong in the comments here, but uh, you consume eight and a half hours of content per day on your mobile, which is just frightening. If you're Gen Z, that goes up to 10.6 hours. I mean, I don't know what you do with the rest of the day if you're spending pretty much 60, 70% of your, you know, woken day um, on your phone. But as an online retailer, you have to be mobile first. You know, 80% of client orders are now being taken on mobile. People aren't as anxious about shopping and pressing the pay, pay button on mobile anymore. So really, really factor that in when you're, uh, you know, when you, when you put your website together and you're making changes. Uh, final one on this page, they're more demanding and they seek instant gratification. A stat that I always love around this point is that the average attention span of the average human being now is eight seconds, which is one less than a fish. So try and factor that in again when you're making these decisions. As a retailer, the next slide will show you what you're up against. So anything, anytime, anywhere, instant gratification. Bonus point to anyone who name first person to name what film that's from, but that's the sort of consumer we're dealing with. I want it now. You know, Amazon will probably you know, ruin that for everyone else in the market in terms of like one hour delivery. But, you know, that has created a trend in the market and, you know, everyone else needs to keep up. So how do we win this consumer? Uh, let's start in-store. So create memorable experiences. Uh, you know, in-store is, I guess there's a lot of analysis going around the future of the high street at the minute but it's still an incredibly, incredibly important part of the customer journey. But 19% of consumers said that uh, additional services being offered in store would encourage them to go and not only buy more with that retailer, but shop again. And with COVID, I can't word count how many times I say COVID, but uh, you'll need to create more of a reason for that customer to leave their house, I believe. You know, what, are you what's the differentiator between your online and your in-store offering no you can be fun with it you be very cool with it there's a stat that's just about to pop up that 32 percent of consumers are still starting their journey uh, with a retailer in store so it's still a third of your customers are, are, are looking to shop this way first up uh, going back to the covid side of it i think that you know, queuing is going to be around for a while. What can you do to make that, you know, breathe and shout about what your retailer, who you are and what your brand ethics are? You know, can you make that queuing experience fun? Starters, um, is there anything you can do? Um, what's the role of the sales assistant as well, which I've, I've given it a lot of thought and I don't have the answer yet, but it'd be interesting to hear what everyone else's thoughts are in terms of, you know, what do they, if they have a store, you know, what do they see their sales assistants doing in the store um, when this all starts up again? Because they've still got to keep their distance. You know, are, are they selling? I don't know. Like, let, let us know in the Q&A. Uh, it'd be really interesting to, um, yeah, to see what ideas you have. A um, real sort of good news stat around this is that multi-channel retailers, um, so people that have had both online and in-store presence, They've actually outperformed pure play retailers in terms of online sales since uh, COVID kicked off. So you can't underestimate the power of the store and almost the fast track approach that has to building customer loyalty. Um, you know, that physical presence creates that really emotional attachment to, um, between the customer and the store. So, you know, it's not all bad news as some of the other newspapers or whatever might like to, uh, to, to say it is. 
the store have an incredibly important role to play. Uh, that said, I believe all of your new customers will be won and lost online. Unfortunately, like I guess I'm, online isn't one place, <laughs> but it's quite a broad term to be honest. But uh, the slide will demonstrate all of the different areas in which consumers are starting their journeys and um, different places they're starting. So 52% are starting from search engines. <sighs> Invest in your SEO strategy if you can. Uh, I, I would say it, with 52% of consumers starting that way, it, it's pretty crucial. Uh, taking it onto like a practical Klarna example, one of our merchants posted on, on LinkedIn that uh, they noticed that consumers were searching for the product they wanted and the word Klarna afterwards. They didn't actually care about the retailer they bought it from. They just knew the product they wanted and the way they wanted to pay for it. So you know, if, if you are a Klarna customer, um, one of our merchants, you know, do factor that in. Um, if you're not, then be aware that you, know, you can work your SEO strategy to your advantage if you're not the preferred choice. Um, or the favourite retailer this person, you can still win that customer. Um, and it goes on to this next point uh, quite well, actually. So 47% uh, of shoppers are going directly to their favourite brands and retailers' websites. So there's not much you can do to disrupt that 47%. If they have their favourite stores, they'll go to their favourite stores. But what I will say is that, you know, it's all the more important that when that consumer lands on your website, to make sure it's an effortless experience, make sure it's a really, really smooth experience. And that way you can fast become their favorite retailer, the place they'll go to first um, before they go to maybe Google or the place they go to before uh, social media. So it's all about getting it right that first time. Um, obviously, auction sites, secondhand marketplaces. I won't go into too much detail on this, but 25% is still a really, really healthy chunk. Make sure you communicate your brand really well for these channels. So there could be 12 similar products side by side. Don't just sell the product, sell your brand where possible and what your brand ethics are. Because ultimately that's what wins out and building a really, really long-term relationship with the consumer. And uh, finally on, on this slide, uh, social. To be honest, I, I think 13% is quite low, but uh, I, I gave it a bit of thoughts and uh, I don't know, I don't necessarily start my shopping journey on social media, but it plays a part. You know, I might browse a product um, and then I'll get followed around by targeted ads on Instagram or Twitter, um, or I might browse a product for a considered purchase and then I'll check their social channels. Um, so it factors in, I might not be starting on social, but it's definitely playing a part. So you need to be aware of this sort of content you're driving. You know, social media isn't just a place to sell, it's a place to discover. So again, with your content, don't just sell, 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 really add the value uh, to, to the consumer when they're browsing. Another Klarna gift coming up, be warned. So be smooth with three O's. This is our company ethos, our company slogan, if you will. At, at Klarna, we have a relentless focus on creating the best customer experience. And we want to change the way people feel about buying. You know, ultimately we're, we're a payment uh, provider, but we want to be so much more than that. Uh, whether online, in-store, customers, they love to buy but they hate to be sold to. Uh, someone said that to me a few years ago and it's, it's really resonated. You know, I love to buy, I can't be stopped to be honest. We've had a constant stream of things being delivered uh, throughout, uh, throughout COVID, but I hate to feel like I'm being sold to. So like, with that in mind, I always think, just make it as easy as possible for the customer to buy. You no, know, don't be too intrusive on their journey with lots and lots of pop-ups or anything like that. Just make it as easy as possible for them to buy and as smooth as possible. So we put that quite succinctly. Um, friction causes frustration. So 60% of Gen Z shoppers won't use a website that loads slowly uh, or difficult to navigate with Shopify. I mean, hopefully the majority of you are on that, but uh, <laughs> considering we're here, um, you know, don't really have that problem. But, you know, if, if you take longer than a second to load, you're going to start to lose uh, that consumer. As I said, eight seconds is the attention span. So invest in services that empower the consumer on their journey. All of the... Our research, market research, shows that convenience is as important as cost. So 46% deem value as the most important factor when making a purchase. Not cost, value. So they're happy to pay a little bit more if the whole experience is in line with what they would expect. All right? So we all have a bargain. You can't get away from that. But 
ensure that you're delivering that smooth experience um, where you can. Now, you've got them onto your website, you've got them to buy, how do you keep them buying? So again, we love a gift. This is where we want to end up, shut up and take my money. So it, it's easier to sell to an existing customer compared to a new one. You'll be looking at, with a new customer, about 20 to 25% uh, return rate in terms of them coming back and spending again. With existing customers, that's between 60 and 70%. So the odds are massively stacked in your favor two, three times over. And ultimately, if you want to scale the business really, really quickly, it's about getting these customers to keep on returning. So how do we do that? Ambassadors, I'm not talking about you know, flashy Instagram influencers. You know, they can be great, but they can lack authenticity. So just keep it in line with your brand. But I'm talking about what I mentioned earlier, that organic customer um, can be an organic ambassador um, you know, who's had your product, tried it, tested it. Um, they will help you grow through word of mouth. So if you have those reviews that I mentioned, those sort of click of a button reviews, and ready for new consumers to read, but also ready for existing consumers to post. 26% um, of consumers said a positive review encouraged them to make a purchase. Like, that's huge, 26%. But you need to stack the odds in your favor, right? So make it easy for your customers to share. I'll keep repeating myself, but it's really, really important. Um, next up, and we use this phrase a lot at Klarna, the experience is the new loyalty. So uh, rewards, loyalty schemes, still really really important and you know I, i'm joined to a few um, and they do play a part but consumers they desire experiences whether it's online in store that's ultimately what they're looking for so from pre to post sales like you have to replicate this experience everywhere it has to scream your brand and um, you know you can't be like, really really friendly in your marketing um, right up to the point of sale the second that you know they've made the sale all of a sudden you're very formal and it's like, well, I'm not talking to the person I was five minutes ago. You know, be really consistent with your messaging right throughout that, the funnel and you know, create those memorable real life experiences online. It, there's some really, really good examples actually. Um, I'm sure we'll go into some in the Q&A, but um, yeah, I, I'll, I'll talk through some of them, uh, most of which you use a shop for, which is obviously great. Uh, creating a community. So this will help you stand out from the crowd and this will keep that uh, consumers coming back uh, and spending their money. Social strategy is obviously really, really key here. However, you know, th there is a lot more to it as well. You know, it goes back to the efficacy and the consciousness of the, the consumers, um, or conscientiousness um, of the consumers. So um, your morals, your brand ethics will help you build that community. And also, uh, you can be funny and have a sense of humour. Um, let's not be too wooden. So there's a stat that we use, 33% uh, of customers said, uh, smart, humorous messaging will encourage them to shop with a brand. Um, you know, I'm not saying be too bold or too over the top with it, but you know, you can bring a little bit of fun to it. Um, so definitely factor that in. And finally, show the customer love, but not too soon. If I, if I'm your customer and I've just bought from you for the first time, the goods haven't even been shipped yet, and I get an email from you and it says 10% off your next order it really, really devalues your proposition, your brand straight away. And it's only building a short-term relationship with, with the customer. You know, you might get them to spend again, but will you get them to spend repeatedly, which is ultimately what, what you want, right? So again, feel, focus on building those long-term um, emotional brand connections. And it comes back to that community point as well. Of course, feel free like, to send an email to the customer um, once they've purchased, but it could be something completely different, like you know, your Spotify, Spotify playlist. It really ties in with your brand. It's a bit cool, it's a bit out there, and it's getting them to buy into the brand on a really long-term basis. So ultimately, uh, you've implemented those points. How do you measure? So this is a bit of shameless self-promotion. I apologize in advance, but uh, and it's a cop-out as well on my part. But we published a report uh, with Andrew Busby, who's a really, really high-profile retail uh, journalist, and he found a business called Retail Reflections. But uh, we partnered with Andrew, and this report, it looks at disrupting customer acquisition. And as part of it, Andrew looks at a new way to effect, effectively calculate um, customer lifetime value. And you know, every pound that goes out, how much comes in effectively in terms of uh, new business. And there's some really interesting formulas in there actually, so I'd, I'd recommend checking that out. Um, the report also goes into some of the points I've touched on, 
uh, customer acquisition, conversion, loyalty, advocacy, um, more than I can do in this sort of 10, 15 minute presentation. Uh, so just a couple of points to leave you with really. Make it easy for to share content, for the consumers to share content. Click of a button, um, reviews, social competitions are really good as well. Um, that user generated content and make your website mobile first. Uh, all channels on all of the time. People are shopping around the clock. You need to keep up. Uh, build your community, lock in the love. I mentioned this throughout. So it's all about those real life experiences, then personal connections, and then experiences the new loyalty. So create an experience that delights, but also builds trust if you do the basics really, really well. Just do the basics well. Um, I guess that would be my one piece of knowledge if I only had to pick one piece um, that I would leave you with. Uh, that is pretty much it. So I'll leave you with a really flashy Klarna GIF again. Um, and I'm guessing we're now time to go back onto uh, our Q&A. <laughs> yes, thank you so much, Johnny. Appreciate that. Uh, we've had some questions kind of popping through as you've been going that, um, going, going through that. I think there's lots and lots of really valuable information on there. Um, before we go into the main questions, we wanted to get the the inevitable COVID questions out of the way, so uh, we can move move on with that. Obviously, it's a, it's massively important at the moment to understand uh, what you can be doing, what what might be happening post COVID. There's lots of things to consider, lots of things that are still unknowns, uh, but I'm, I'm sure we all have opinions on that. So I suppose the first the first thing to, to, to put to the group is what is your general view of the e-commerce market and the retail market in general during COVID been? Uh, what, you know, what's the actual reaction of the market and uh, moving on from that, what, how do you see the market moving in a post COVID future, whatever that might be? Jace, I don't know if you want to uh, yeah, I'll, kick I'll off say, with that. Yeah, I'll say a few things. Um, obviously working with lots of different clients in, in you know, many different verticals, there have been, you know, some winners and some losers, you know, in this situation. Um, ultimately, online spending is now, you know, higher than it's ever been. Um, the problems that a lot of our merchants are facing are now around um, stock availability, you know, their, their supply chains, um, where, you know, for instance, fast fashion or clothing brands, um, you know, would naturally get kind of supply from East Asia. They can't kind of fulfill that anymore. So, um, a lot of brands are kind of becoming a bit of a victim of their own success at the moment. Um, as far as kind of how this is going to play out, um, it's going to be interesting what happens around kind of the Black Friday sort of time, which is something we're kind of talking to a number of merchants with at the moment. Um, high street retail is not going to go back to any type of normal for quite some time. Um, people's reluctance and hesitation to actually make those unnecessary trips, um, especially around peak times. So, you know, I think online shopping is, is you know, it, it's not just here to stay. It's been the digital transformation is now being accelerated um, by the current situation. Uh, we are seeing as a, you know, as an agency, we're seeing more and more clients, new clients come to us, asking us to get them online very, very quickly in order for them to be able to still um, kind of offer value and offer the products to their merchants, where as before they used to just be traditional bricks and mortar. Um, there were some interesting topics that Johnny kind of had in the uh, in the slide as well about kind of you know omni-channel. Um, you know the the fact that you know you have a physical location for a lot of merchants or a lot of kind of customers. Sorry, sorry um, does give a certain amount of reassurance, like from a brand point of view. Um, you know, pure play digital kind of businesses have done very well from a um, an overheads point of view. You know, they can be more agile when it comes to marketing spend. They can kind of uh, test and, and, and fail, you know, fail fast and quick. Um, whereas, you know, traditional bricks and mortar companies have been a bit more, uh, you know, slow turning, but they're going to have to kind of change. Otherwise, you know, they will end up, you know, they will end up going the way that a lot of other larger British institutions have kind of gone, um, like, you know, House of, not, not House of Fraser and, you know, lots of others along those lines. Um, so yeah, it's, it's interesting times. It's not nice times. It's interesting times for, um, you know, for retail, both high street and, you know, and online. Um, I'm sure some of the other two have got some other comments to kind of throw in. Yeah. I mean, uh, for, for me and, and for the, the marketing team at Eastside, I think it's, it's really interesting to see how, like Jason was saying, some 
some clients have really thrived um, and some clients have, have struggled a little bit more. Um, we're talking to another partner of ours, Kerry at, at Loyalty Alliance. There's, there's a podcast coming out a little bit more about this, but she, she described it as the new essentials. There's these, there's these various verticals now that didn't feel like they were necessities or essentials before, but are absolutely in that range now. Um, alcohol was definitely one of them. I can't remember what some of the others were, but this whole new range of things that people would generally buy as an aside, probably buy in store that they, they haven't really had the option to, or there's been a limited supply. And therefore those industries have, have really boomed. Um, I think the situation has forced through some, some general changes in uh, things that are going to be popular. So, you know, we're looking at potentially, people not being able to take public transport and therefore other forms of transport became becoming a new essential. Uh, people wanting to get out and exercise, exercise at home, things like that are going to be a new essential. So all of that is going to shift. And some of this may return just to what's most convenient, but I think there's definitely going to be a shift in what people are buying online. Also just the fact that some people who previously wouldn't have bought online have now been forced to really uh, a whole generation of people that, that maybe still didn't have the confidence in it or maybe still didn't have the want to shop online have now been put in a position where really they, they have to in order to get some of these essential items. Um, so I think it, uh, you know, who knows what the future is going to be like solidly, but there's definitely going to be a shift. My opinion is that some things will turn back uh, to, to just what is efficient. You know, what is, what is most convenient for me at the time? You know, if it's easy for me to nip to the local shop, I'll do that. But if there's other bits where I have formed a relationship with a brand throughout this time because they've done a really good job of communicating with me and I've, you know, I've I've gone through this whole new phase of discovering many more brands than I probably would have otherwise, just because, you know, maybe you have more time pre and post work to do that kind of discovery. Uh, but there's definitely this is definitely a time this has definitely proved how important online is. It's not to say that bricks and mortar stuff still can't be important, but without online in a situation like this, you're pretty much lost in the woods. Um, Johnny, I'm, I'm sure you guys have got some stats on where you've seen peaks and flows and, and how behavior has changed through COVID. Yeah, definitely. Uh, obviously without giving any sort of individual retailer insight out, uh, no surprises that uh, health and beauty um, home and garden um, have absolutely skyrocketed. It's, you know, you're looking at near on 100% increase in, in terms of the home and garden across all age groups as well. Um, obviously, that's slightly skewed towards uh, baby, baby boomers um, who have just had exponential growth. But uh, people are just spending more in terms of um, making their home environment as comfortable as possible. Um, and on the health and beauty side, they've obviously got more time to, to pamper. Um, so treating ourselves a little bit more. We're seeing basket sizes with health and beauty uh, increasing as well. Typically, like, the basket size was around 20, 25 pounds. So mm -hmm. people were using online um, for beauty, and um, we felt to, to, to restock. Um, whereas those basket sizes are, are going up now, and we feel that people may be getting braver with decisions like that. Obviously, because they can't get to a store to try the products. Yeah. Um, they're getting a little bit braver. And then like, going into luxury as well um, people that obviously have been fortunate enough to keep their jobs you know may have been saving for a holiday something like that they and that or they're saving on travel they've got that little bit of extra cash and mm -hmm. so i think like i've spoken to like a number of, number of jewelers and they've seen like watch sales go through the roof a uh, number of jewelry retailers that have closed their stores have actually outperformed what they did this time last year just with online so it's so like really like obviously there are winners and you know on, on the flip side fashion has obviously struggled um, within that there are obviously different you know loungewears obviously on the up <laughs> um, and if you, if you want to include like fitness um, and athleisure clothing in that obviously that, that's on the rise uh, but it tends to be like footwear um, has struggled um, just because people aren't really going anywhere and to show off their new shoes mm -hmm. so in, in short, it, it really depends, but there have been winners and losers, really. In, in terms of where we see it, the store, as I said in my presentation, it definitely has a place to pay. Um, it just needs to justify the reason for that consumer to leave the house. 
what what is the reason for them to come to the store if they can do, if they can do that online you know create that experience it might not necessarily be about selling your products mm-hmm. and to be honest i think the retailers that have done best during lockdown are the ones that haven't tried to sell the ones that have really tried to add value and like really nice content those are the ones that really will win out um so it's almost you know what you're doing now i know it's really really painful for for your business but in the long term i think you're actually building a really long-term foundation with a set of customers that will keep on coming back i think it's it's essentially forced certainly in my opinion forced a lot of brands to do the things that they probably should have been doing anyway that have always that are always yeah we'd love to do that but right now we need to make sales is is the standard response when you talk about any kind of long-term tactics or strategy um and content for a long time i think advertisers and marketers have been talking about content as, as a key part of any strategy uh, and giving value without asking for anything in return and that's that's really what this has forced people to do um you know there's brands out there that, that are doing a really good job of this you know especially the home workout brands or athleisure brands that are just giving a, giving away workouts for free mm-hmm. um and giving away home workouts for me that's something that should have been happening from day one of that brand really any of those brands in any of those situations content is is such a key part of it and it can't be ignored just because it doesn't necessarily offer a return on day one um so i think yeah a lot of people are being forced to just do what what they probably should have been doing as part of their strategy in the first place um just as just spotted one of the questions here um we'll try and answer this one uh, it's probably for you, Johnny, just based on what you were talking about. Are you, are you finding that more people are paying via credit rather than traditional payment methods um, at the moment? Is that increased throughout this period or are you found that generally it's just more people buying rather than more people choose, choosing to pay via credit? Um, so it depends. We have two main products uh, at Klarna. So we have a pay later in 30 days where it's, mm-hmm. you, know, you get the products and then you have 30 days to, to, to make the payment. Or we have a slice it in three option, um, which is split over 60 days. Mm-hmm. Uh, the, the slice it in three option has proved, I mean, both are, have been really popular, but the, the slice it in three or pay in three option, I should say, um, my marketing team will tell me off for that. <laughs> um, that, that is really, really um, skyrocketed. Um, you know, it's considered purchase, um, but you just want to, I guess, def- defer the bulk of the payment a little bit further down the line. Um, just until you know there's a little bit more security in the market and things like that. So it's just about managing managing finance a little bit more effectively, really. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, um, that's as sort of as, as much detail really as sort of give on that without going into really really granular. <laughs> but uh, yeah, it, it, it depends. Uh, the pay later option actually, pay later in thirty days, has worked really well for um, merchants attracting new customers. Yeah and it's been consistent uh, throughout lockdown you know i've not shot with this merchant before i don't know what the products are like i don't want to hand over my money and then have to wait for a refund if i'm not happy so you know ultimately client we take all the risk um you know the customer tries the goods we pay the merchant and if they keep the goods the, uh, the customer pays us yeah um so yeah uh, again it, it depends <laughs> but, uh, yeah but both have been like pretty popular to be honest Awesome. So I think we've, we've talked a little bit around how we think behavior is going to change, what current behavior is like. Uh, Jason, in terms of, in terms of thinking about messaging uh, and, and how you communicate with customers throughout this period, um, what's your kind of view on how brands have approached this? Have they, have they directly referenced covid have they kind of hinted at it through their communications like how are people approaching this in terms of messaging from from your experience uh good question um i think some brands have adopted the you know a a position of care very well um and responsibility um you know it's something that there's so many brands out there that are um you know pivoted into you know making ppe um from a messaging point of view um like I said, it, it, it's down to how they've kind of framed their products and their services uh, in a way that is going to add value to the current kind of merchant or the current customer, should I say. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Uh, Johnny, any inputs on that? Um, oh, I could talk for days. Uh, <laughs> I, 
I think there's a lot like obviously within brand right like, within your brand guidelines, but there's, there's an opportunity to be funny with it. I, I don't know about you, but I'm sick of seeing the word COVID nineteen. It feels like I'm reading the news. So if I if a brand that I love sends that phrase to me, I'm just like, oh come on, you know, it's almost like yeah. Obviously, there's a really, really serious situation going on here. Um, but, you know, have a little fun with, with your brand and around it. Um, but then also, obviously, like welfare is obviously a huge part. And to know that brands are, I'm shopping with are looking after their staff, mm-hmm. that, that's massive as well. You know, and, and, and I, I think every brand, to be honest, apart from maybe Weatherspoons, <laughs> um, have, given, have given that um, that impression, you know, that they actually care about the welfare of their staff. So surprising to see Weatherspoons act in that way. They're usually <laughs> so forthright and caring. Um, I think, yeah, I think it's interesting. Uh, there's, I think you're absolutely right, Jase. It's the, the kind of care aspect of it and people pivoting their business and, and developing things either for free or as a donation. I think the other thing, just, just to kind of answer that question that was delivered uh, prior to the webinar is uh, what we try to do is spin is a bit of it has negative connotations but it's about how you can represent your brand as brand as best ad, adding value for people in this situation so you know if you're if you're a lot of what was talked about was how do you make your home office work but if you how do you make your home environment more comfortable uh beauty brands were talking about treating yourself and pampering and um you know had pivoted to more of those at home treatments because you can't go to a salon or you can't uh, you can't go to a spa so there was a lot of understanding what the benefits of your product are to the consumer in a specific situation again probably something that should have just been done anyway all that's happened is this situation has forced people to understand what the consumer problem is how their product solves that problem and to communicate that effectively without overtly selling the product that is what marketing should be it shouldn't just be about facebook remarketing ads they're important and they serve a purpose, uh, but it shouldn't just be about pushing product down people's throats all the time. Um, there's that famous quote uh, that people don't buy a quarter inch drill bit. Um, you know, they, they, they want a quarter inch hole. That's what they're looking for. That, and take that further. They want to put up a shelf on that shelf. They want to put awards or they want to hang a TV so they can sit and watch TV with their family. There's a whole range of emotional things that you can that you can extend from beyond just this is the product and this is the function that it serves. And functions and features can just be copied by anyone at any point uh, with with zero effort really. Your your emotion the emotional aspect of your brand is, is much more important, I think. Um, awesome. Shall we have a look at some of the questions that have come in um, as we've been talking? Uh, there's some Shopify specific ones here. Uh, let's take a look at this one. Uh, now that the Slate theme has ended support, is there a recommended alternative or anyone uh, who has forked out and still maintaining it? Um, You're going to ask me that, aren't you, Lewis? I think it's probably going to be you, Jason. I've got a mute for this one. <laughs> <laughs> um, we don't actually use Slate as a theme. We, we, we never have, really. We, we use our own deployment tool and system that we've built. Um, so everything we build is not on Slate and really never has been. Um, I can't, yeah, I, 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 there's no silver bullet on that that I'm going to be able to give you. Um, I'm quite happy to introduce you to our C, uh, CTO and he can explain how our system kind of works and how we, how we go about kind of, building, kind of building websites to scale so that multiple people can kind of work on them at one time and um, the kind of methodology behind our kind of architecture for you know, building and maintaining Shopify sites. Um, but yeah, we've we built our own tooling. I suppose there is there's a risk when you buy into any particular piece of software, any particular theme, any particular framework that isn't that essentially isn't open source, or you're depending on a particular uh, development system. That there is always a risk that you're that you will outgrow that, or it will support will end. I mean, lots of people are going through this at the moment with Magento 1.x. You know, it's that coming to end of life. They're in the same position. Um, so it's a difficult one. There's lots of different answers to that, I suppose, and lots of different solutions to that single problem. Um, but if you want to, like Jason said, you can jump on the Eastside Co website, drop us a drop us a uh, a message on there through the contact page, and we'll be able to go into more detail about what some solutions to that might be. Um, okay. Um, let's take a look at this one. Just started my Shopify store, providing office-friendly appeal for young women. 
uh, we've customer acquisition stage. We're at the customer acquisition stage and started working on our SEO to grow organic traffic, but not seeing much results so far. Uh, how do you bring a target audience to visit your website at an early stage? Um, maybe I'll take this one. Um, there's lots of different ways to do that. SEO is great, but you, you're probably not going to see results from that for three to six months. Uh, and depending on what market you're in and how competitive it is, you know, there's, there's obviously more difficulties. Um, for me, this kind of brand social is probably going to be your first port of call. Paid social is cheaper than, than Google ads at the moment, probably not for much longer, but it certainly is at the moment. Uh, and you can get yourself in front of lots of people um, quite quickly and present your product to lots of people who, who should, if you target it correctly, should have a direct, direct interest in your product. There is no single tactic though. And I think we say this a lot. You have to think more strategically than what tactic will make me money. It has to be what range of tactics over time is going to make my business successful. And it's the difference between do you want to sell a product now or do you want to have a brand that exists in 10 to 15 years? Uh, if the question, if the answer is I want a brand, then organic social, paid social, PPC, SEO, um, you know, a, a, a website that offers a good experience, um, you know, multiple payment options, very easy experience throughout, great customer service. All of those things is what's going to make a brand. Um, to get people to your site initially, though, social is going to be your cheapest option, I would, I would say, right at the beginning. If you've got a little bit more budget, maybe look at uh, Google Ads, PPC. Um, with both of those options, it's very easy to spend money. So just be careful. Uh, if you can't, you know, if you're not in a position to invest in someone to help you with that, an expert who knows what they're doing, then just be very cautious and very careful. Find something that works first before scaling it. Uh, so test multiple ads, multiple targeting, and then start to push it out as you're getting return on investment. Um, but SEO, you should continue with SEO and, and all of those long-term tactics because you really thank yourself in six months' time when you start to see organic traffic coming through that, you, that you're not having to pay for. Uh, but you need to diversify. Uh, Jason, I don't, you may have stuff to add to that, but um, strategy first, I think. Uh, I'll unmute you. There you go. You need to unmute, Jace. I thought you said you would unmute me. I tried uh -huh. to. Sorry, the technology failed us, guys. It's the first mistake. Um, yeah, strategy first. Um, you know, you really need to have a roadmap of where you're trying to get to. Um, and work backwards um, and ultimately go for the long term rather than short term gains, you know, building customer relationships and having a great product offering a great service, you know, the under the, you know, the, the foundations of any e-com business really, um, you know, rather than going for, you know, so many quick wins or, or kind of, you know, easy money, um, play for the long game. That would probably be my, uh, my recommendations. Um, Superb. Johnny, any, anything to add? Or have we, have we given away all our secrets already? That was a bit of a masterclass. Um, so <laughs> um, it'd be interesting to understand which channels are on social. Like, I, I know um, you see, well, you published a really great article on Pinterest. And I've noticed myself buying a lot from Pinterest. And there's like sponsored, like, like sponsored pins and things like that. Be, I'd quite like to understand a little bit more about that, really, because it's not something I know a huge amount about. Well, our head of content, Matt, wrote that blog. Um, <laughs> um, no, I think I always looked at Pinterest as they, they were almost one of the first people, I think, to try and uh, turn, turn kind of social into a shop front, really. Like, viable pins was quite a while ago now. Mm -hmm. And they never, they never really took off in the same way that um, Instagram and, and yeah. Facebook has. But I always looked at Pinterest as like the search engine for ideas is, is how you see it. You go on there, you have your board. I'm doing the garden at the moment. I have no idea what I'm doing. Pinterest is where we go to figure out, you know, what that's going to look like. Same for your house, pre-buying a house. It was about what's the inside going to look like. Um, so there's definitely the opportunity there uh, for purchases. But at the very kind of foundation level, Facebook and Instagram pretty much owns that market. 
Um, certainly the integrations with something like Shopify or any e-commerce platform, to be honest with you, um, it's very easy with Shopify, but the integrations exist across, across platforms. It makes it so easy to, to, to integrate that and for people to be presented with products. Uh, and it's really clear what the cost per acquisition is, how much you're spending. So that's usually where we start. Um, but it's not to say you shouldn't be on Pinterest, Pinterest should, sh you, that you shouldn't be building out an audience on there. Maybe it's a place where you start by building an organic presence first. And then once you've got an audience, start to feed in, um, you know, start to feed in paid media through there. Yeah, I have no more to add, no more. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, okay, awesome. Let's, uh, let's take a look. Let's go back to some of our, to some of our questions that were submitted prior to, um, to the webinar starting. Um, so we've got a couple of Klarna questions here. Um, uh, number one, do you try at home pay later functions work with Shopify Advance? Uh, do you have an example of this? Um, I'm sure Johnny probably has lots of examples on from, from Klarna himself, but I think it's a fairly, fairly quick one to answer that one, Johnny. Yeah, uh, it, it's a yes. Um, to be honest, most of our integrations, uh, particularly in the UK, Shopify uh, uh, of varying forms plus advanced. Um, so, yeah, I mean, hundreds, maybe thousands. Uh, I'll have to check, but yeah, absolutely. And it's a really, really easy, really quick integration. Um, and seeing as that one was so quick, we'll hit you with another Klarna question. Uh, so this one um, from Matt Klimberg. Uh, what's the spend behavior and profile of customers paying with Klarna compared to PayPal or other online payment methods? Hitting you with a hard hit in questions now. Okay, um, two bits to that. So profile, uh, Klarna customer, it, it's evolved actually over the last two years. When we first launched in the UK, uh, four and a half, five years ago now, um, we were typically working with just our pay later products and working with fast fashion. And just what, you know, natural, um, I guess, yeah, natural side effect of that is that we're working mostly with 18 to 24 year old uh, women. As We've diversified our portfolio of merchants. You know, we work with everyone from you know like Halfords um, to you know luxury menswear clothing, um, and also the launch of the paying free option. That is now it's fifty one percent female and forty nine percent male. Uh, paying free option tends to be more popular with men, particularly in fashion. And we find that, um, that men want to shop three times a year, maybe, but do it all in big bulk <laughs> and then split it over the next couple of months. Um, I, I myself um, sort of fall foul to that. Uh, in terms of, I, I guess, how we compare to, to, into PayPal, you know, different, different propositions, I, I guess. PayPal, you know, it's been around for ages, right? But um, where we sort of sit differently is this ecosystem of consumers that we're building up, uh, building up rather. So in the UK, we have eight and a half million consumers that want to pay with Klarna, love to pay with Klarna, pay with Klarna month in, month out. And that's their preferred payment method. And by building that uh, that ecosystem, we're actually sending those consumers around the Klarna network. So, you know, yes, we are a payment provider, but we're actually we're working as a marketing acquisition tool for a lot of our merchants, driving newer, higher value consumers uh, to, to merchants where they haven't shopped before. Um, and you know across the board as well increasing that average order value um as well and again with that paying three option people may come onto your website saying i'm only spending 50 pounds today and they will only spend that 50 pounds uh, but they'll slice it in three so effectively um, you know getting 150 pounds of basket value and then they'll pay over the next three paychecks so um it completely depends that profile depends again on the retailer um, you know, Geo as well is obviously a part of it, you know, where the consumer is based. Um, but yeah, I mean, uh, Matt, I'm happy to pick that up with you offline. Um, just feel free to drop me an email. Um, I'll, I'll share my details. On mute. <laughs> I made the mistake. It's okay, we're back. Um, <laughs> let's have a look here. Uh, I think this might be a good one for you, Jace, just to throw this at you. Uh, 
would you say that independent brands have a greater opportunity to thrive during this time? Since the closure of temporary shops, we have found a greater footfall level of interest than before. Um, so, yeah, I suppose this is, you know, these much bigger established brands that have maybe struggled to turn the ship uh, versus smaller brands that are, have managed to be a bit more agile. What's your kind of view on... Can you repeat the first part of the question? I missed you. Yeah, so it's um, this is the guys from Wiley Club Official, and they said... Would you say that independent brands have a greater opportunity to fri- thrive during this time? Uh, and, and they've said, since the closure of temporary shops, we've found that we have a greater footfall and level of interest than before. Uh, yeah, it's, a, it's probably an ideal time to, like you, you know, if you're an independent brand, you could be more agile, you can test things. You know, you've got a, usually a better, you know, better pulse on you know, who your customer is and the relationships with your customers. You know, the brands that we work with, the ones that are, um, you know, founder, owner, manager, you know, they've been disruptive brands. They've been usually started by a couple of founders. They're very close to their customers and they listen um, and they can really kind of act in an agile way to make sure that you're, they're giving their customers the products and the services that their customers really want. And also the content, and the community side of things as well. Um, you know, we've seen some of our brands. Lazy Oaf is probably a good example of one that's built a big following and a big community. Um, based on the fact that they sell you know, very wacky products, but they're loved by millions of people um, for the products that they do. You know, they do produce and the style and the, um, that they've, they've kind of, yeah, they've got, they've got a cult following. So, you know, ultimately it's a good time to, you know, to really kind of, you know, engage with your customer a bit more um, and test out some new ideas. Superb. I think I think it's absolutely right. It's the the ability for for newer brands to move very very quickly. Um, and like I said, I think there has been a real shift in terms of people's people's want to discover new things during this period. People are, people are actively going out on discovery journeys for brands and for things that they either didn't necessarily know that they wanted or new problems that have been presented to them that they didn't have to solve previously and. Uh, I think the ability for younger brands or more agile brands to spin up very quickly or to to capture that user base has has been phenomenal really um like i said there's there's very specific segments in the market where we've seen people get very very good results in a very short space of time because they've adapted quickly and, and they've been able to move quickly without tears and tears of decision makers. Uh, figuring out what the right way to go is. Um, I think so much of marketing, certainly digital marketing, is about testing and learning quickly and, and implementing what you discover as quickly as you possibly can. Um, uh, another quick Klarna question here. Can Klarna be used for a subscription service? Maybe slightly more complex than... Uh, than the uh, yeah, yes. yes, it can. Um, but again, that's the, it can get quite granular there and it might not be as entertaining for everyone else. So, uh, yeah, again, yeah. just drop me an email um, and, and I'll, I'll pick that up with you. Awesome. Uh, lots of people want to do subscription stuff <laughs> at the moment. Um, uh, so, uh, what, with the onset of COVID-19 and a lot of customers' disposable income beca- becoming heavily affected, what's the success rate of working with Klarna and offering credit? Has this improved business conversion rates? I suppose we talked a little bit about this earlier in terms of the rate of people using credit versus not using credit. Um, yeah, it's, it's potentially a slightly more difficult question to answer, but, um, any thoughts on that? <laughs> yeah, I have loads, Jason. Do you have any? Uh, <laughs> um, I was, I was going to say time in the month is also a kind of an interesting topic with Klarna based on the fact that you need before payday and kind of after payday and people's purchasing kind of patterns throughout the month, you know, actually potentially wanting to shop a few weeks before payday, but not actually having the disposable income at that point to be able to check out, you know, when you've got Klarna, um, you know, integrated and, and rolled out, you know, it enables you to be able to, you know, to, to take that product and, you know, pay for it in 30 days um, or split it over three. Um, sorry, Johnny. Yeah. I'm... So ultimately like right around the whole, um, payday terminology, we are actually really, uh, really quite strict with our merchants that, you know, we, don't allow any of it, any of that word in your marketing. You know, if mm. you're you've gone, absolutely not. No, yep. no sort of, as I say, we're building a long term ecosystem here, right? Of customers that want to pay month in, month out. So, you know, we have to do sort of um, soft credit checks, like affordability checks to make sure that 
um, the customer can afford um, the products that they're putting in their basket. Um, so yeah, I mean that, that whole time of the month thing. I mean, obviously, it does have an impact, but in terms of the way it's promoted, actually, like we distance ourselves um, from anything like that. But in, in terms of conversions, you know, it depends on how early in the funnel you're, you're talking about Klarna. If you're talking about us in on your social media, uh, a consumer will then get onto your website knowing that they can pay with Klarna, either pay later or pay in three. So it's affecting their, impacting their decisions around you know, which items they put in their basket, how much they have to spend on their card. And there and then versus how much they're going to spread over the next couple of months. So yeah, it, it it depends on how much you want to shout about us or not. You know, I guess that's that sounds like I'm sitting here promoting Klarna, but it, it's entirely up to you. Um, those that really really embrace it um, tend to see stronger uplifts in terms of conversions, in terms of average order values. As I say, because the customer mindset is different the moment they hit that website and start browsing the product. Yeah, I think. <laughs> I think it's worth, uh, again, it's not necessarily about saying, uh, like Johnny, Johnny was saying, just overly promoting Klarna. I think it is a great product and there isn't really a, any reason why most merchants shouldn't have that or something very similar on their site to, to, to perform that job. The re I don't think there really is any negative from offering the people, offering your customers uh, a convenient way to pay or a more flexible way to pay. And um, so, whether I, generally speaking when we've implemented it on sites for our customers it's had a positive impact and that's great um but I, c I can never see it i can't see a downside to it really it's relatively low risk for a merchant relatively low risk for a customer uh and because of the brand that klarna is uh it, it's not just an insular digital marketing thing now it's, it's very well known for consumers, anybody who shops generally has usually shopped on a site with Klarna on it or already has a, you know, they have a Klarna account and they understand the Klarna it type terminology. So I can't see it having any negatives for any consumers. And as long as you've got that balance between not ticking every payment provider box and giving people 20 options to check out because it becomes difficult to figure out which one to click versus, you know, key payment options, you know, uh, a single payment split option. Um, and it, it's probably going to have a, a positive impact on your site. Um, so I think that's probably covered off all of the, uh, lots of people paying with credit. Um, you know, it's obviously not a simple, simple answer, uh, to get straight off. Um, there's a few questions here, possibly from, from actually, this is a UK company and we're starting to see a rise in this and I've not really got an answer to this, but CBD products, um, one of, someone's asked, does Klarna support CBD products? I know there's various payment providers that do and various payment providers that don't. Um, Klarna, is that, as an option, does that support CBD products? Uh, so as um, at, at the minute, uh, no, not fully, not entirely. Um, you know, there are come, like, large yes, pharmaceutical companies that maybe have a very small CBD range that, um, that I believe are but not pure CBD uh, retailers at the minute, no. Okay. Um, and I don't, uh, JC, you may have more of an insight on this. I'm not, I'm not hundred. My view on it is that most, every payment provider is different and around the world, different payment providers have different rules. I don't think there's a clear cut answer on this one, which is we've got 20 sites worldwide selling CBD. Is there any payment gateways that can help us? I don't think there's one solution for all territories. Is there? Probably not. Um, it might be worthwhile speaking to globally. Mm -hmm. um, they deal with a lot of merchant on record kind of currency conversion. Uh, they're effectively a checkout and a process within themselves. So they might be able to help you out. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, I, yeah, the, the problem comes when you've got to use Shopify's checkout system uh, and play within the, the providers that are kind of natively available from Shopify. Um, you may be able to get a kind of a hybrid blended approach across five or six payment providers you, it, this is going to come down to kind of company structure internationally mm -hmm. and where you spin up LLCs in the U S and, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And then how you kind of string everything together and which payment providers you spin out of the different regions in what currencies. Um, I mean, it, it's something that I'm kind of quite interested in. So I would be happy to have a chat, um, offline and, you know, share some knowledge I've got on how we've done, we've done this with customers in the past, not with CBD, but with, you know, just kind of 
other products um, you know, in, in different, different verticals. Uh, awesome. Um, we had a question here about, sorry, I'm having to scroll. Um, is it, we've had a few people ask this, Johnny. Unfortunately, it's for you again. Um, not unfortunately for the audience, but unfortunately for you, having to answer all these questions. This is an, an obvious one. Shopify recently announced um, uh, paying installments or something very similar to that. Um, what's the kind of future for Klarna? And apps like Omnisend now Shopify are, are clearly building in-house products. So I suppose you can you can talk against the the payment the payment options one specifically, and then maybe we can talk widely about Shopify's development of, of various different uh, apps that exist within their ecosystem. Yes, uh, to be honest, we saw it coming. <laughs> um, you know, we work with a lot of Shopify merchants, and um, I guess from a Shopify perspective, that they've obviously seen that. Um, where we see ourselves, um, we, we've been around for uh, 15 years now and we've built this um, this huge uh, consumer base, the people that like to pay with Klarna and have the Klarna app on their phone. And uh, ultimately our, our aim is to, you know, to create a lifestyle brand with Klarna. Now, people go to Klarna to see where to shop next, right? Um, for Shopify to try and do that, I, you know, I don't want to speak for them at all, but um, I, I guess it's trickier where they sit. Um, does the consumer know that they're paying with uh, Shopify payments? Do they know they're paying with like, the Shopify credit plan? Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, I mean, we see ourselves, um, as I say, we still see ourselves here in a few years' time, even with, uh, <laughs> even with uh, the Shopify uh, launch. Um, as we say, it's about giving the consumer as many options as possible, right? And we believe that the, the network that we've built um, and the product we've built um, you know, it, it's really resonating and uh, the numbers are worth to be honest. <laughs> um, to see, you know, that people that are using client month in, month out, um, and love to pay that way. And um, yeah, we, have, we feel that we've built a, a loyal enough following um, uh, across all of our markets. And, and Jace, I mean, we've, I think as a company, we probably have some personal experience of building various functionality and then it, and then it being baked into Shopify. And um, I think Omnisend is, is, is probably a reference to Shopify emails. Um, you know, what's your, uh, this is something that's, that's happened as Shopify has developed as a platform, you know, uh, what, what do you think that means for the ecosystem and, and other futures for, for, for these kind of third party apps? Yeah. So it isn't, I mean, we've experienced this on a number of kind of number of scenarios. So, we've built apps that solve problems for customers uh, and we've done it for years and years, you know, tiny little pieces of functionality all the way through to, um, you know, popular kind of plugins like kind of redirects um, when you're migrating sites. So Shopify obviously has been kind of expanding its feature set and trying to solve some of these problems itself. Um, also has a lot of data when it comes to what functionality and features uh, are really kind of, you know, working for them. Um, last year they announced a number of, uh, a number of new kind of features or feature set APIs. Um, one of them was around product recommendations. Um, you know, as an agency, we heavily recommend Nosto or kind of a few other, um, you know, product rec, um, third, third party tech partners and they're exceptional at what they do. You know, they've built their business around being, you know, personalization and product recommendations and the data behind that, um, machine based learn product recs is, you know, incredibly powerful. Um, you know, the technology behind doing that, you know, is that Shopify's capabilities and for them to be able to bake that into the system, um, you know, make common sense to them. Um, are these tech partners going to be able to, you know, to keep up and keep innovating? Yes, they are. Ultimately, Shopify is doing something not as its main business goal. It's adding functionality and features, but not just kind of championing that element of it. So all of these individual tech partners that are best in class, best in breed, for some of their kind of their, their services or their features, they will always win over from a, uh, a functionality and a feature point of view, probably a trust point of view as well when it comes to kind of some of the financial stuff. I don't know what the pricing looks like around Shopify's kind of paying installments. I know it's not coming to the UK for a while. My international rollout won't be for a while. It, you probably have to be using Shopify Pay rather than any other kind of payment gateway. So there are going to be a number of you know a, a number of nuances that you know have to be factored into that. Um, but yeah, you know, there are quite a few other kind of, you know, still not problems, but, um, things that Shopify will probably solve or that will probably look to do themselves at some point. Subscription may be one, 
Um, could probably use sorting the filtering out on it, but I mean, I know some people have asked questions about it. Should probably sort the VAT out when Brexit happens. Um, there's there's quite a few things that, that Shopify has on its hit list of um, uh, its development roadmap to kind of sort out. But uh, yeah, you know, it will keep taking on challenges like this, but it's not going to be their main business focus. And you know, we're we're still going to see you know very much the need for Klarna and a lot of other tech partners that you know are best in class. Uh, technologies yeah i think that there's a few questions there around shop shop pay uh is it going to be good i think generally you know it's obviously a requirement that people have uh, that, that other people are fulfilling at the moment i think what we often find with with some of this stuff is shop is shopify's attempt is to try and bring this to the masses um and it's not necessarily to start with certainly not necessarily at that tier one brand positioning um so i think there's you know competition is good for everyone i think anyway forces people to innovate forces people to push forward um so generally i think any kind of innovation across any of these platforms is um is good is good for everyone really uh what's your favorite spice johnny <laughs> oh can i be boring and say chili it, it goes no. into much everything, doesn't it? Yeah, um, why not? Chili. There we go. Uh, let's get that one out of the way. Um, uh, this one's a fairly simple one, I think. How do I contact celebrities for my T-shirt business? Um, the really, really simple answer is Instagram. Uh, you can still message people directly without having to follow them. Um, it's a numbers game. You might contact a thousand people. One might say yes. Uh, but if you do that consistently enough, maybe one day, um, you'll have Snoop like Klarna does wearing your t-shirt. Um, uh, yeah. So that would be my suggestion is Instagram and don't just go for your influencers with 20 million followers. They're much less likely to reply. If you, I don't know if you've got a streetwear brand and there's an up and coming rapper or hip hop artist in your local area. That's got like three, 4,000 followers. That's the level. That's the guy. Um, you know, if you get 10, 20 of those people wearing, wearing your, wearing your gear, then I think that's going to be probably more impactful, um, than a single, maybe potentially getting a single influencer with 20 million followers. There's probably some data out there. Um, I know social chain have done some stuff in the past around, uh, the effectiveness of large influencers and, and people have built their brands. Large audiences don't always mean large sales. In fact, there's some really some really key cases of people with very large audiences struggling to build to sell their own their own products never mind other people so uh i i would say do it for free for wherever you can instagram is the easiest way to do that and find those mid-level lower level people who really resonate with what your brand is about and get them wearing your gear um also just get everyone in your local area wearing it or your whole group of friends just everyone um I think someone asked a t-shirt question in one of our last meetups but yeah just get as many people wearing it and give it to them for free uh and if it's if people like it within a specific genre then they'll start to pick up where you're at um uh, there's another shopify pay question here we've answered that one i think um i uh, could do with some advice on marketing a new shop online with very limited budget this is a fairly common question i think um Jace, do you want to do you want to jump in on that? Very limited budget. Uh, you've got some experience with starting up e-commerce brands. Um, yeah. What are, you, what are your thoughts? It depends on the product. Um, I, yeah. I, there's to, to give a broad brush kind of answer to that. Um, it all comes down to research. Um, SEO, you know, is probably one of the most cost-effective and long you know, going to produce long-term fruit for you, but it's, you know, quite intensive when it comes to actually, you know, the labor to put into kind of do all the work and the skill set that's required. Um, but as far as, you know, like I said, long-term results go, you probably should start with SEO and make sure there's a foundation there. Also working out who your customers are, um, you know, working out those buyer personas, who your customers are, where they are, and what you need to be saying to them. Um, Building an audience organically on social media is probably the next one. Again, you know, limited budgets means you're not going to be able to go out and spend thousands of pounds in PPC or, you know, Facebook ads trying to drive awareness. You're going to have to look at, um, you know, edgier and other tactics out there uh, to try and drive customers. 
Um, like Lewis said, the influencer side of things, you know, can be done pretty cost effectively. Um, we've had people that have bootstrapped their business and executed kind of strategies on this that have, you know, like I said, gone out and spoken to, you know, a hundred smaller kind of influencers, sent lots of free products out to them. So it's only cost them, you know, the stock rather than actual cash. Um, and have started to build some momentum by the fact that they've managed to get, you know, a number of people wearing their products and they start kind of getting noticed. So, you know, there's a number of different ways to kind of go about this, but ultimately, you know, you're going to have to just use what you've, you know, what you've got available to you really and try and be as, you know, as clever and as witty as possible at getting yourself in front of, you know, who your ideal customer is. Um, ultimately, the repeat customer side of things as well, uh, just to add, you know, if you've got a good product and you offer a good service and you take care of your customers, they will become, you know, advocates about you or, or your brand and your product. Uh, it's going to be much easier for you to scale your business on the long term. Uh, if you go for longevity and that customer relationship. Yeah, Tim Charles is a really good example of what you mentioned there. Um, I know obviously we're all like, one of the fastest growing businesses in the UK, even outside of retail. But um, mm. you know, Ben Francis started the business I mean, when he was at uh, uni and got those, I guess, low-key but niche influencers. Yep. And then he just built this brand around them, didn't he? You know, he, they each had their own range. They each had their own... Uh, Spotify, Spotify famous. Um, try saying Spotify off. You've been saying Shopify. Shopify yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, but yeah, like they, and they created their own like almost like sub brands within within this giant brand. Um, so things like that, and you know, to create shop and um, Spotify famous, it, it's not. It, it's pretty inexpensive to be honest. Um, it just takes a bit of time. Um, things like that are really, really good at engaging um, and building that community and, and creating that tribe as well. That's like a word again we use a lot at Klarna. If you've got those diehard fans, they'll not only keep buying your product, but they keep shouting about the product. <clears throat> so try and create that that sort of feeling within your core customer base, um, and then grow organically from there. Yeah, I mean that that, that leads next onto this kind of next question. I know you talked a lot about community creation, um, and I'm a big fan of that community, like brand ad advocacy stuff. So. How do you create a community for a luxury brand? I think the question should really just be, how do you create a community for a brand? There's maybe slight differences with luxury versus mm. it's, it's all about, I, I, I suppose, touching on some of the points in your presentation again, Johnny, really. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, so social is obviously a really, really big part of that. Um, yeah, we spoke about Pinterest, but Instagram, Twitter tend to be uh, the main um, I guess, protagonist within that luxury brand. I would imagine would be stronger on, on Instagram, obviously. It's more aesthetically pleasing. And um, that's where it should all really start out from. But then it's about when they get onto your website. And um, there's some really cool brands, um, like a Brighton based uh, menswear uh, brand. And they have their own radio on, on the website and they've got their own mixes. You know, got them, um, it's always music based, but things like that, but they tap into areas of your life that aren't actually related to the product itself. Mm -hmm. And things like that I, I just find are really, really cool. You know, I'm sitting here talking about it, it's live long in the memory. Um, mm -hmm. Obviously, you know, it might not convert to a customer straight away, but you're actually you're attacking their psyche and you're building that long-term relationship. Um, and then it's about over time sort of content that you push to those consumers, you know, whether it's newsletters uh, and what's included in, in those newsletters. Don't always try and sell to your community. I think that's probably, um, probably the number one tip to be honest. Um, I, I know we obviously all, all need to keep our businesses going in the right direction. But don't always try and sell, add the value, um, and then and then selling the products will, will come next. Um, but I, I think it's just about exploring which channels work best. Um, you probably you need to try all the channels. You can't afford to say, oh, that doesn't look right for us, and then don't do it mm -hmm. um, because you're running the risk of missing out. You know, try it. If it doesn't quite work, then then wind it down. But I just think you need to give as many channels a go as possible um, across all social. Um, yeah, I guess that would be my tips. I think luxury for a long time made the mistake of lots of luxury fashion brands. We're not going to sell online. We're not going to. We're not going to be part of that. That's not what we do. And you know, now, now has proven that that kind of stuff is a mistake. But they'd already started to realise that that wasn't. That what they needed to do was actually reflect reflect what they were doing in store online. Um, I think what most people forget about community, community building is even big brands, you ask them, well, what, what do you stand for? You know, what, 
who are you what's the brand and, and they they will come back to you with functions and features like you know well it's really quality material or etc cetera, etc cetera. but that doesn't resonate with people there's lots of people who are selling high quality material out there like why buy from you over anyone else i think you need to get those emotional aspects right and you need to communicate that and you said this in your presentation johnny it doesn't stop at the sale uh you know monzo is a really great example of this you know really personable like it's like talking to your friend um when there's a community uh, when there's a when there's a customer service issue you know the responses are very much in the same vein as as the language on their website it runs through everything they do I, I, you know try and name a bank where other people are sharing their conversations with the bank in a positive way on social media it doesn't exist apart from Monzo, they, you know, they've done a really good job of that. And lots of other banks are trying to now follow suit, both in terms of technology and, and communication. Um, so you need to understand who your brand is first and, and, and what you stand for. And then you build a community based on, you find people or people find you who resonate with what your core mission is, regardless of what that is, luxury or, or anything else. Um, we've probably got... Uh, only a couple of minutes now, really. Uh, we, we haven't had a chance to get through all of the questions, but I think we've, we've covered off a fair range of stuff. Um, is, is there anything else you guys want to, you know, COVID related or not COVID related? Is there anything else you guys want to close with? Uh, any, any kind of final tips or, or secrets? There must be a marketing silver bullet. There must be something we can give to people that just solves all their problems. Uh, I was going to follow on with the community aspect of things. Kind of... Sorry, yeah, carry on, yeah. But no, no, it's, uh, it's, you know, we could keep talking about a lot of these different topics for, you know, a long time. Um, you know, I think there's a, a couple of examples, like Lazio being one of them, that exclusivity and, you know, feeling part of a club, um, you know, has been really, really, you know, beneficial for them. But another company called Pure Scooters, where, you know, they're, they're now going to bikes and they're producing a lot of video content, a lot of how-to guides, a lot of, you know, rich you know, rich content, rich media uh, that adds a lot of value to, um, you know, to their customer base or prospective customers. Um, any final comments on the current situation? Uh, hang in there, I guess. And if, <laughs> if, if you're not kind of, if you're not trading online at the moment, now is probably an ideal time to kind of dip your toe in. Uh, if you are, now is probably an ideal time to really expand and grab the ability, you know, grab some of that awareness whilst people are staring at their phones all day. Mm -hmm. Johnny, anything else from you? Um, yeah, I, yeah, I guess it's not all doom and gloom, but the, situ the situation is changing on a daily basis and particularly on the, I guess the independent brand side of things, I think ultimately you're in the position that you're in. Um, because if you look at sort of the larger multinational brands, they want to try and create that, in that independent feel to some of their stores. They don't want it to seem like a copy and paste. And you, that's the way it's going. Um, so, uh, yeah, the smaller brands that have a physical presence on the high street, I think that that's, they will be, um, in essence, like they will be the, the future of the high street. And I think the bigger brands will build around that, to be honest. Um, you know, they, they will be, um, I guess, what will speak for that, that community. You know, if you go to a village in Kent or, you know, or Durham, um, if you're working in politics, um, <laughs> then, you know, you'll know that, um, you know, you, you know you're on that high street by the brands they've got there. They represent um, that sort of, the feel for that, that space. And yeah, I think, as I said, I think the bigger brands are going that way as well. When it comes to social media as well, a lot of bigger brands don't really respond to their, um, their customers. And I also think that's a massive opportunity missed. You know, if someone comments on the your post, you respond back. Yeah, um, really, it seems really basic, but independence again, you're in a position of strength where, where you can do that. Versus, I think a lot of the large businesses are cottoning onto that now. It releases that bit of dopamine, right? When you get a response from a favorite brand, mm -hmm. you're automatically engaged. So, it's a real missed opportunity if you don't do it. Um, it's not really a concise summary, it's just more a few points that I didn't get in earlier when I wanted to. And, uh, I guess, yeah, from my point of view, just uh, so thank you, um, yeah, for taking the time. Um, yeah, we'll do the wrap up. So for, for, for everyone who, who joined today, thank you so much. Um, if you signed up, we're going to send this recording out to everyone so they can um, uh, watch us in slow-mo, they can rewind back, they can maybe maybe listen back to some of the answers of the questions. We've got over 100-odd questions prior to this. We've had another 
30 uh, odd whilst we've been going through. So sorry, we haven't been able to get through all of them. What we'll try and do um, is pull the kind of question themes together and along with the recording, maybe send you out some key, key answers uh, from our collective experience. Um, I think from my point of view, for all the new people starting off just as a closing, as a closing statement, the biggest thing that you have on your side is your time, which at the moment is, is absolutely free to you. Mostly what you pay other people for is their time. Um, so having the ability to do the stuff that Johnny was talking about, not just be on social me media, pushing content out, but actually going and engaging in a community and replying to comments and uh, replying to other people's comments within your niche. All of those things are really, really powerful. And, and all it takes is time. It doesn't cost you any money where you do have money to invest, just do it cautiously and test things and learn. Um, you know, don't, don't just spend 50 pound on an influencer because they've got 10,000 followers, uh, you know, test things out yourself, build an audience yourself where you can. Um, so there's been lots and lots of great questions. Really, really appreciate all of you joining. Um, hopefully we'll get another one of these in potentially in person next time, potentially, uh, potentially streaming again, maybe even both. Um, but yeah, thank you to Jason for, for his time and Johnny for his time too. Um, we'll share the deck, we'll share the video, we'll share everything after this. Um, but for now, uh, see you guys again soon. Thanks, Johnny. Thanks, Jason. Thanks, guys. Cheers.